my name is Karen Carter, and I have the privilege of uh, having worked in this wonderful space, 401 Richmond, and we're sitting in the Urban Space Gallery today. Um, I'm going to be begin by acknowledging that we are in Toronto and thus on uh, lands for the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and Wendat peoples. We are also, as if you live in this city or know this city, you know that as you walk about this city, you can't often tell where people hail from. And uh, some of that is because of the way indigeneity is represented. And so we also have to acknowledge the Métis, Inuit, and also indigenous peoples from all over the world that call this place home. Uh, I will also personalize, because I don't know about you, this land acknowledgement thing is mostly tedious and feels like this rote thing that we do that means nothing. So my remedy for that is just to acknowledge that as a woman, Jamaican heritage, uh, with maroon uh, roots on my dad's side, uh, and that's a person of African descent connected to those who uh, came to this land through forced migration. Um, we know that as people of African descent, we are in this part of the Americas by choice and by force. And so I think I uh, and those that look like me have an extra responsibility to the indigenous peoples of this land, given the history, the shared history we have. So this uh, project is, um, it's been interesting to be a part of because I did not know the landscape architect. I did not know Cornelia's work and then did some research. You go down rabbit holes when you work in the culture sector when an opportunity comes your way. So I'm gonna throw it over to the lovely Emery who I came to know literally through an email to say, hey, we're doing this thing, we'd like to collaborate. And at the time, I believe the exhibition was still in uh, at the University of Alberta. We were in the COVID insanity and not sure when it would get here. So we're happy to say that it is currently at the Metropolitan University, um, newly named, we won't touch why, uh, but I will throw it over to you, Emery, to uh, just give some context around the background of the talk. And there are folks on the screen as well as here, so we're doing this hybrid of virtual and in person. So please bear with us if technology may not be our friend for a moment or two, all right? Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Hello, everyone. I'm Amy Calvelli. I'm the adjunct curator of um, the Pool Center of Design at the Art Gallery in Alberta. And as Karen mentioned, uh, we started this collaboration a couple, maybe at least a year ago. Um, and uh, the it, it is in relate, I wanna actually first thank Jennifer Ward and Karen Carter both because you've been a really wonderful collaborator to work with. Um, and I'd also like to just put out a call to the Toronto Metropolitan University to the, um, Paul H. Cocker Gallery at 325 Church Street. Um, it's a little tricky to find, we could, but it is worth your while. The exhibition Cornelia Hahn Oberlander is up uh, as we speak, and it will be up through um, September. Um, this is an exhibition, uh, Cornelia Hahn Oberlander, Genius Loci. Uh, it's an exhibition that uh, Dr. Hilary Letwin and myself co-curated. Uh, we started working with Cornelia in 2019. Uh, and the exhibition has been a couple of places, uh, both the Western Vancouver Art Museum and the Art Gallery of Alberta, um, and is currently in Toronto. Um, it was um, uh, just to give a sense of Cornelia without uh, too much detail, I wanted to mention Cornelia was um, born in 1921 in Germany and left uh, Germany in 1939, uh, came to the U.S., um, when she left, uh, one of the things that she took with her that was um, that she talked about was a letter that her grandmother gave her. And her grandmother had said, and there's more to the text, but one of the sentences in this letter said, whatever you do with your work will see the legacy of the next generation. And I think this is where we're at right now with that seed sprouting in different ways. Um, Cornelia went on to um, start work in 1944 at uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Design, studying with Walter Gropius. Um, this led to a seven decade career. Uh, she's worked with architects Arthur Erickson, Moshe Safdie, um, uh, um, uh, uh, Louis Kahn, Louis Kahn, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Forgot his name for a moment. Um, and I think uh, has really been an advocate for working with design in a different way. And I think it's a real privilege to be able to hear from both Gino um, Pien and Eva Matsutsuki who have worked with Cornelia and have much more depth of experience. 
And I'm also really delighted that Gail and Zoe are both here today. It's going to be a wonderful conversation. And I will turn it over to Kara and Karen, and we will start that conversation now. So thank, thank you, you very much, Jeremy. We're going to jump in. You guys ready? And I can yes. begin with Gino. Oh. Yeah. Is that okay, Gino? I thought you were going to be. Be good with Eva, but uh, Eva Eva has spent more time with uh, with Cornelia than than I have. Uh, I uh, worked on three projects, two of which were built, and Eva uh, has a lifetime with uh, Cornelia. Eva, please. Thank you. Passed from Gino to me. Uh, yes, I I worked with Cornelia. <clears throat> First of all, every, she ref Everyone refers to her as Cornelia, not, you don't need the full name. Everybody knows Cornelia. Um, I worked with her <clears throat> with uh, 25, over 25 years on numerous projects and we were friends for 45 years. So <clears throat> I would have a lot of stories, but due to time constraints, um, I'd like to make <clears throat> reference to three projects that we worked on that are, are quite different just to show the variety of, of, <clears throat> of the work that we did. Uh, I think the, one of the important things that everyone would say that it, it was fun to work. It was, this is an important aspect. I, I think, especially these days, we're kind of stuck in technology and uh, working with Cornelia, um, was fun times, which meant we kept our positive attitude, kept a sense of humor. Um, before we started work sessions, uh, we did things like read poetry or uh, tell stories about, you know, if the blueberries were in season or not. Um, but in, uh, in, in the spirit of that, uh, I decided that I would start my little talk, my petite talk, with a poem. Uh, and I chose uh, from Maya Angelou uh, called Phenomenal Woman, but I'm going to change the singular to the plural because there were many women involved. Phenomenal Women. Pretty women wonder where our secrets lie. We're not cute or built to suit a fashion model size. But when we start to tell them, they think we're telling lies. We say, it's in the reach of our arms, the span of our hips, the stride of our step, the curl of our lips. We are women, phenomenally. Phenomenal women, that's us. And I dedicate that to all the women who have traveled this sometimes bumpy road. <laughs> but here we are. Thank you to Cornelia and all the others that made this possible. Um, so, um, Jennifer, could I have the first image, please? There's technology. There we go. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is a, a building at University of British Columbia. Uh, and it's called the CK Choi Building, but that's just um, the, the main donor. Uh, and it's a it's a project that was built primarily on, on a, what was an existing parking lot. And the client assumed we would cut down some of those trees and tuck the building in there. But right from the beginning with the team decided that the wonderful sustainable and respectful thing of the forest was to not cut any trees. So the, the building is just strung out on this parking lot and the landscape architect just had to put in a few ginkgo trees along the boulevard and you could send them home, right? Who, who needed a landscape architect? But in this project, it was very different. We, as a sign of 
sustainability, among a whole other bunch of attributes, uh, we decided that there would be no sewer connection and we do composting toilets, three stories of composting toilets uh, in an institutional building instead of a cabin out in the woods. And the, the, the reason I mention it is because uh, after you get all the, the poop and the piss <laughs> in these bins in the basement, uh, what do you do with it? And the liquid part, has to get somehow filtered. So it got pumped up and Cornelia did this fabulous uh, research on plants that would filter this, uh, what's called the liquid or tea. Why is that a great euphemism? The, the tea that comes out of these uh, toilet bins. And just by the research, there's uh, gravel, there's, there are sedges, lilies, reeds, and you can, the image, the part that we see under the curved roofs, you'll see right next to the building, there's a narrow strip, and that's our sewer line. And what I love is people walk along the sidewalk and they have no idea that we're actually doing all this. And then by the end, when it gets to this end, that is pure enough, it's been filtered enough that it's used in a careful way to irrigate the forest. So all of a sudden, the landscape architect is invisible, but it made the system possible. Without that filtering system, uh, that whole concept wouldn't work. So that's one little piece. So if I could have the next image, please. There. Uh, this is uh, Monteverde Estates in uh, West Vancouver, and it's a very steep site and therefore hadn't been developed. And our client, instead of an institutional, was a developer that wanted to build. The original idea was, you know, clear cut, build 20 expensive homes and make a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, when we were working with Arthur Erickson and the concept was totally different. It was to uh, honor and work with the landscape as much as possible. So most of the houses are built on stilts so that you touch the ground as lightly as possible and to allow the landscape to slide down through so that whatever the ground cover is, the trees were mainly uh, fir trees and cedar trees and outcroppings. So that I think the architecture and the landscape architecture totally depended on each other. Um, the, the trees would pop through this driveway or through people's decks. Um, and their presence was always sort of honored. And, and Cornelia called it judicious pruning so that the, the tall trees obviously um, represented by these little sticks. Um, this was a study model. They would get some of the branches cut so that it, the, the feeling would be more airy and there would be some views. Anyway, it exists very happily today. Uh, a few uh, months ago, while Cornelia was still alive, we had a phone call from their group and they said, oh, should we be doing some more flowers or bushes to, and um, Cornelia said, no. No, just leave it, let it do its own thing. And that's really the beauty of it. Um, so again, it was uh, the design team's respect of, of the land and that site. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is actually where I first uh, met Cornelia. Uh, again, this is an Arthur Erickson project known as Robson Square. Uh, in the center of Vancouver. 
And I think for everybody, this project is totally landscape. The architecture is hidden. It was a, a huge amount of office space for the um, British Columbia departments. And when the client said, okay, let build me 300,000 uh, square feet of office building, the concept with all the consultants again involved was to lay the building down on its side and build a park over it. And it's right in the center of Vancouver so that it becomes a place of refuge and, and gives the land back to the people. And, and everybody's welcome to it. Um, you can see there, there are obviously waterfalls. There are what we called flying planters. There were planter boxes. Um, and uh, it's, it's just a wonderful example of the landscape being dominant and the architecture being the uh, invisible component. So to conclude, uh, I think you can turn that off, Jennifer. Thanks. Um, I, I think my main points are that those three projects are very different in how uh, the architect and the landscape architect work together um, and how each one very differently responded to its siting. Um, and at, out of the end of it, I think, I hope architects continue to understand the importance of landscape architecture. Um, I saw a quote recently that I want to read to, to end this piece is, um, the advice is that architects must learn to see buildings as artificial insertions into natural systems. So pick landscape architects that are of the same mindset, of the same goals. And I hope that the other people in this, in this little discussion uh, ask really tough questions because <laughs> I think we're ready for that. <laughs> thank, thank you. Over to Gino. Thank you for that, Eva. I was going to say over to Gino, but you don't need me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. Uh, that, was, that was great. It, it, uh, it brings back uh, many, many fond memories. Um, I uh, first uh, introduced uh, to um, Cornelia through Matsusaki Wright, through Jim Wright, a partner of Eva's. Uh, we had, um, as part, we were commissioned to do a legislative assembly building in Yellowknife. We were residing as architects, uh, had an architectural firm in Yellowknife. And uh, we, um, to to uh, to complete the team, we had a, a, a large group of of uh, architects and and engineers and other consultants, but we lacked a what I considered an appropriate landscape architect as part of that team. Uh, we were we re, um, met Saki Wright were retained um, by our team and the government of the Northwest Territories when the project had been designed and was in design development, which is beginnings of working drawings. And um, um, we were concerned with the siting of the building. The building was placed uh, by us in a peat bog at the uh, outskirts of the peat bog, uh, overlooking a lake. And um, we wanted to uh, nestle the building into the site. And we had, we had accomplished that through the, through the development up to uh, design development. Uh, and uh, Jim Wright suggested um, uh, an appropriate uh, landscape architect would be Cornelia. And uh, we met with her or, uh, 
uh, immediately enamored by, by her philosophy and her personality. And she was she became part of our team and was able to accomplish all those things that we um, were concerned about and, and wanted to address. And she did that by not introducing any non-native material. The, the, um, the work that she uh, undertook was basically to reconstitute the peat bog, which was in front of the building, between the building and the, and the, and the city, and to ensure that the, um, the, the surrounding landscape uh, was maintained. It's a rocky outcrop site and we minimized uh, rock removal to just a, a, a few pieces of rock under the building to actually get services in. Uh, the rest was, uh, if, if you're familiar with the building at all, I, I'm not showing slides of it. Uh, you have to go and see it or, uh, or look at it uh, on the internet, but it's, uh, it, it, uh, it, it really, it, it takes, it sits within nature beautifully, takes advantage of nature. And uh, when I went north, um, I, I flew in in a 737 at 35,000 feet. And uh, what, what I was uh, um, enthralled by was the, the, uh, the landscape below. And uh, I was, when I arrived there and, and, and started involvement in architecture, I was totally intimidated by what, what nature had to offer. And as an architect, I felt that I could never achieve uh, buildings that would um, be comparable to what nature has to offer. And my feeling is that, that uh, the aspect of, of working with what you have around us in terms of both society and also the, the environment and the landscape uh, was in tune with um, Cornelius' philosophy. So we, uh, we worked with her, uh, firstly with that building, and uh, its culmination was really with the um, East Three School in Anuvik, which is a K to 13 school, uh, which again uh, is um, located within, oh, thank you. That's the Legislative Assembly building. You can see it oh, sitting yeah. here. Uh, the, uh, I'll, I'll speak further about the, this is the, the East uh, Three School. And East Three is it was the third site that the uh, uh, federal government chose uh, for the location of, uh, of uh, a new community on the shores of uh, the, um, uh, the Mackenzie River. Uh, Cornelia was able to um, uh, sort of nestle that building in the natural landscape that we, we uh, that exists there and that we wanted uh, uh, her to work with. The, uh, the beauty of Cornelia was that she never undertook design without, first of all, getting a good sense of what it is she was dealing with in terms of society, in terms of the environment, in terms of the landscaping. Uh, she, she was a, um, an unbelievable, a diligent researcher uh, and spent a great deal of, of time uh, working out what uh, she wanted to end up with. Uh, the, um, we were uh, fortunate in that we were, uh, we were able to work with Cornelia uh, in her late, later years all that wonderful knowledge that she had accumulated over the years was, was made available to us. Um, she, she actually uh, made working on a project as part of a, 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 a larger team fun. The, uh, I think, I believe that this lost in, in the current design aspects because of, 
of the nature of, of uh, direction that, that building has taken and uh, the lack of the ability of, of design consultants to actually work uh, with the users of the building and, uh, and as part of a, being able to select the team and work as part of a, of a fun, uh, knowledgeable design group. Um, Cornelia uh, really made, made working uh, on a project uh, memorable. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I have questions, but I'm going to hold them. And uh, who's first? Gail, Zara? Sure, yeah. I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> Let us know, uh, Eva and Gino, if you cannot hear and we'll make adjustments, but essentially audience, they are, as you can see, uh, contemporaries of um, Cornelia and had personal references around working with her and knowing her. And then what we have now with these two brilliant uh, young women are uh, the next generation. So their comments will be about where they are in their particular career, not necessarily because they knew uh, Cornelia or reference the work directly, but where landscape architect is going from a female perspective right now. And we're lucky that they're two black women and they didn't <laughs> happen to be Jamaican. I didn't make that up. I'm not. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, it is it is such a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Gail Schilling Ford, um, educated as a landscape architect. Um, I had fabulous uh, professors in my educational career. Uh, Bob Alsop, um, uh, Linda Irvine, we talked about Virginia Burt uh, together at lunch, um, that, uh, that influenced uh, me or were part of influencing me to, to shift to the, the urban design realm. So, you know, I've been pushing and spearheading the, the landscape architecture conversation in the, the bigger picture context, um, which, is, which has been extraordinary. Uh, because in my process um, and the firms that I've been able to work with, both urban design and landscape firms, um, I have been able to push the conversation both at the you know, city building scale, the planning scale, right down to the, the detailed design level of landscape architecture and be uh, part of all aspects of that conversation. So it's, it's just a thrill to be here, to be part of the Cornelia conversation. My name is Zara Brown. I'm a landscape architect and arborist. I joined the landscape architecture community after working in air traffic of all things, <laughs> while trying to find something that was somewhat between art and science. I'm not totally artsy and I'm not totally sciencey. So this was a really good middle. And placemaking has become an ever learning journey of how to address it in the context that it exists, because, you know, you can have the same neighborhood with two completely different needs. I started out in the municipal environment. So I worked in New York City Parks and Recreation, where we were the leaders of our product projects. I now work in consulting where we engage with other disciplines on a large scale. In particular, for my practice, I engage with planners mostly, but I do work with engineers of all different types. And the thing that I relate to most with Cornelia, both being from somewhere else and coming here, but also the idea of connecting with the environment as me being part of the environment. And so that drove her engagement with the community, which I found to be very good. and wanting that to re-emerge in the way we practice today. So we do public engagement, but my feeling is that when she did it, it was more of a getting to know you conversation versus uh, getting to know what you want conversation. Mm -hmm. So her designs are more from a personal exchange rather than just a design mind. I would love to be in that space with her to be able to do that and even to just go through the process, the whole idea of, you know, starting meetings, uh, we talked with Ava before, starting meetings with a poem and really just getting into the creative process and being able to engage both with my team and with the client in a way that 
produces a landscape that is memorable, as Gino said, is really something I, I will look forward to because we still have the capacity to return to that type of design. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna uh, jump in. So you've heard from our, our four brilliant panelists and one of the themes that came out in the pre-chat was this idea of a return. The notion that we, the way things worked at a particular time were as uh, Zara so eloquently stated, it was you got to know the client, you were getting to know the community and Gino mentioned, she was constantly talking to people and just getting familiar with where she was and the space. So I wonder if uh, we can have all of you comment on that idea of what would we be going back to? Because I also feel, you know, sometimes one romanticizes the yeah. past. Yeah. And so I'm sure there are elements of Cordelia, Cornelia's struggle as a woman mm -hmm. um, that she was, Gino again mentioned, they he met her at the um uh in the winter of her career so she was seasoned and all of that brilliant knowledge came into her practice so you wonder you know what was summer like what was spring like how how was the early stages so maybe what would you as much as you talk about where you want to the things you want to pull back that you feel are being lost what are the things that i feel like the two of your presence even on this panel says something about some of the things that we know are good, which is greater representation in the sector. My um, response first is time, <laughs> that she took time. Um, we we do have bills to pay, so we have to <laughs> generate our, you know, we have to process our projects, which is fine, but the design process, I feel, of that generation, so it's Cornelia and all the others mm -hmm. of that time, is that they took the time. Mm -hmm. And that's what allowed the engagement both with the client with the community and with her team. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I don't, I don't think Cornelia's vision has changed, quite frankly. I think we've, you know, gone through time, but I think her vision is still very relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the idea of um, being leaders in what we do, uh, the idea of being collaborators um, and, and encouraging and pushing collaboration you know, between our disciplines, I think is very relevant today. Uh, the idea that, you know, we are two women and two women of color sitting here in front of you, leaders in our professions mm -hmm. is, is continuing her vision. Um, you know, her process, just, you know, the idea that um, landscape architecture is not a sub um, um, concept to architecture or, you know, other disciplines that, um, we need to be sitting at the same table, at the same level as the architects, as the engineers. Um, we are not sub-consultants to those disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, I think the struggle is still here. Mm -hmm. we, we're still in a man's world mm -hmm. and we still have to deal with that. But I think our voices have become louder because of the likes of Cornelia. Um, and I think that's something that's, you know, that, uh, that we have to keep in mind, um, mm -hmm. certainly as women in our profession, you know, that she has, she has trailblazed for us um, and we are still tra trailblazing. You know, the, the issues are somewhat different, mm -hmm. maybe, uh, you know, the things that we have to deal with are, you know, our race and equity and climate change and, you know, these things are, you know, as insurmountable as some of the things that she had to deal with in her time. Um, but her vision, the core of her vision is still relevant. Okay. Do you want to pick up the torch from there, Eva or Gina, who wants to go first? Yeah. I, I would like to, and I, because I think um, uh, Cornelia's been, and I think rightfully, but she's been given a huge amount of credit. And I think that one in that looking back also, uh, we have to realize that when she worked in the firms in, um, let's say in Luke Kahn's or Dan Kiley's office in her very early years, um, she was the student. Right? And those people were her, her mentors. And when I got to know her, it was 
um, with Arthur Erickson. And, and I, I just bring that in because um, he, he had the, the, the courage or the, the wisdom to uh, uh, include her in the team. It, it wasn't, it, so I, what I'm saying is I think the architects bear a huge responsibility to get the landscape architects in the team early and as equal partners. If, if the architects don't see that, then your battle is so much more difficult. So one, and Gino and I were talking about it too often now, the client, uh, clients are developers. And so th th they're not in, so interested in, in how the teams are put together. They just want the end product. And uh, I think it has to be, um, the whole team that has to recognize that it ha has to happen from the beginning. Um, and so, yes, it's the, the landscape architects have to push the boundaries, push the ceiling and, and, and lead the way in that sense. But I, I also want to add that, that if that my profession needs to, to get its act together, and, and push harder. It's kind of been wimpy. It does what the developer wants. And, and I, I think we have to push back. That's, that's my quick comment, not so quick. What do you think, Gino? I, I agree totally with you, Eva. I, I think the, uh, the profession has changed and I, I really uh, sympathize with uh, those that are practicing currently. Uh, in, in the design professions, the uh, built design professions. Um, it, uh, I found uh, very early on that, uh, that um, our, this, the strength and the success of the projects that, uh, that we worked on was the aspect of collaboration, being able to first of all, get a, a uh, be fortunate enough to, to uh, have a client uh, retain you that um, appreciated the type of work you did and appreciate what you had to offer and uh, was ready to um, assist you in putting together the best team possible. And I found over the years that it was really important for continuity within a uh, the design team disciplines. You, you really, it took a while to actually what I used to call train your consultants and, uh, and once you sort of had, had them at a point where you spoke the same language and understood each other and were able to have confidence in each other, it took a few projects. And if, if you don't have success in, in, in a, a functioning team, you cannot produce good design of any ilk. It, it is essential that that's team um, respects one another and is prepared to work together and to fight to ensure that uh, all those that they're dealing with are sympathetic to what you're trying to do and in, in agreement with what you're trying to do. Um, the, uh, the success of the projects that I worked with, with uh, Cornelia was that um, we were part of a team that really were uh, appreciated one another and worked well with, with one another. And uh, we learned from each other. So over the, the years of, of, of uh, practicing, going through projects, you develop your philosophy to a point where you're really comfortable uh, with what you're doing. And it, you, a successful project is not what you think of the project, it's what the public thinks, not necessarily your client, but what the public thinks of the project, how the public responds to the project. And to do that, you have to do a lot of preparation work to be able to get a clear understanding of what it is the public um, um, really expects. And you have to uh, educate not just your client, 
but the public. And uh, Scandinavian countries uh, have, have brilliantly uh, accomplished that. North American uh, society appreciates mundane design, not good design. So as designers, uh, be they landscape architects, engineers, uh, architects, you, you really have to work at educating society out there. And we as a profession are not strong in that. Mm. Can That's I follow up? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I to follow up too. I know. Yeah. <laughs> one, one of the themes that keeps running through is, is the idea of working together. And it should be noted that a multidisciplinary team does not mean a no. collaborative team. Mm -hmm. And what Gino and Eva are, you know, lamenting is the fact that we need to get back to being collaborative teams, which is what I strive to be part of. It. And if I can add to that, we have to stop asking for permission. Mm. We have to stop asking for permission, you know, we are a critical component of the design process and the collaboration. And we have to stop asking permission to be there and to be part of it. And we have to stop being afraid to get out there and, and to, to be in front of a client. You know, the, the, the problem with our, our process has been the architecture has been the lead. The architecture has been the face mm -hmm. to the client and, and, we are, you know, we are three steps away from the client and, and that's not collaboration. Collaboration means A, we, we don't ask permission. We get in front of and a part of the, the client conversation right at the beginning, the, the poem mm -hmm. at the beginning, we are part of that poem and that story with the architect, landscape architects, urban designers, the engineers, everything. And we are sharing that poem together from the get-go. And then we are we continue to be that collaborative team throughout. That's multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary or whatever you want to call it. That's the true sense of collaboration and having that respect for 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 each discipline to know that we all bring a richness mm -hmm. to the table. We all have a responsibility to you know creating whatever we're creating, um, and it's it's not just you know through an architect's lens mm -hmm. and. I and I find that the more, um, the more we have that, that close and intimate relationship with the client, the more beneficial it is. I've worked on projects where, you know, the client has hired the architect to do the job, the architect, you know, we work through sort of the architect's process. We push ourselves into that conversation and, and we expand the opportunities that the project has. And it's beneficial to the client because the client is now, you know, creating a product that is more rich, that is more attractive to the end user, that is more suited to the end user more often than not, and that considers a whole bunch of things that the architect may not consider, right, or, or whomever else. So, I mean, we are part of creating, you know, the environment and managing the environment and managing public space, etc. So, um, I, I would like to interject if I can, and that is, I think, we recognize that this is going to be uh, not an easy path. Yeah. Um, I, I look back and I think um, in, in my generation, it, this was true of women, right? In, in, uh, when I went to school, we were two out of 40. Uh, when I joined um, Erickson's office, where I referred to, we were probably 60 people. I, I was the only registered female. There were two or three who had studied architecture, but, and that has totally grown, right? It, the numbers are totally different now, but I think what you're saying is still true that it's still um, white male dominated. And uh, it, it's, it's not going to be easy, but just like uh, women in general had to push and uh, people of color have to push, it's, uh, it's an uphill battle, but we have to do it. What I'm afraid of is people um, saying, oh, they won't listen or they won't let me become an associate or a partner. Um, I just want to encourage 
people to not give up and look back. The looking back, I think, perhaps gives uh, incentive or courage to say, okay, m might not be as fast as we want, but, but we can't give up. Amen. We can't give up. <laughs> so I'm going to, because we're at 2.15 and again, you turn around an hour has gone like this. Yeah. I know we have an audience here, uh, Gino and Eva, who I, I'm, I'm looking at you. Some of you are like, I want to jump in there. I have a question or a comment. Um, I have a microphone, but I also feel like you may not need that because it's really loud. If you just yeah. speak from, you know, is this me, the Baptist in me? Who used to <laughs> I grew up in a church where you went to like project it's a tiny little church. So I'm good at that, but maybe not uh, everyone else. Anyone have questions, comments? Tegan? Uh, I have a question for Eva. Uh, if that's okay, I have to repeat it. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes? Uh, she can't hear you, but I'll repeat it. Um, for the first building that she worked on uh, with the slanted or the slope uh, roof, how did they account for the weight of snow uh, oh. for that? So uh, Tegan, young woman in the audience, Eva wants uh, to ask a technical question about the first uh, example you showed of the project you worked on with Cornelia to uh, talk about the snow weight, that, that slope, whether or not, I guess it's more of an engineering question about how we would have gone about uh, accounting for the weight of the snow, or was that an issue? Was In my mind, when I see it, I think the slope means the snow just flows off. Was that what was happening? Uh, I guess the question is uh, the snow on the roof. Well, in Vancouver, it rains. <laughs> yeah. so um, in, no, it's, it's snow on any flat roof. I mean, we don't get enough that the weight would be an issue. It's it's kind of typical. And the curve in the roof, where they were designed actually to have solar panels on them, but um we had a typical budget it wasn't a fancy budget and we just didn't have enough money to put the solar panels on uh, the hope was that it would happen uh, one day which 25 years later it hasn't but so snow was uh, um it's not a, an issue in vancouver yeah i wasn't sure i thought it was vancouver so I'm so tegan's my cousin <laughs> she is from the UK. So she's a new Canadian. And that's the question, not recognizing the Vancouver. You're laughing, but that's what just happened. <laughs> I love her though. She's my people. So Start of the question. Does anyone else have a question or comment? Can I ask if there's architects or landscape landscape architects in the designers in the house? One, two. My husband's Three. Not, he's not putting his hand up. Should I be an architect? Not putting hand up. <laughs> so I wonder if you're if this if the the comments if no one has a question if the comments resonate if you if this is what you're seeing in the industry especially because I see two women are you architects or landscape architects? Landscape architects. Architects no. <laughs> my team <laughs> feels like there was me yeah. women team <laughs> yeah. yeah so is she is she is, is she be is she being accurate around her commentary tell me the truth about gail Go ahead. Uh, actually excuse me, excuse me on, on the question of the snow on the roof uh, that's one good reason to have a good uh, team together. You, as an architect, you depend on the structural engineer to resolve that issue, and you hope that he's done it properly. Yeah, true. Very true. Yeah, that's right. I I could not hear the last woman's. Um, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna hand the microphone over. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna hand the microphone over and we're gonna pass it to a couple of members of Gail's team <laughs> who happen to be here. Also because I'm fascinated because they're women of color. So to your point about just the way the industry's changing, we're sitting in this room and uh, we've got like four women of color, five who are all uh, working in the sector. Um, in in design from architecture to landscape architecture to urban design so it's it's that 
homage almost to change in process. Anything you want to say? It is on. It is on. Um, yeah, I like um during the work um in Yorkdale, I definitely see she has been trying to push in the boundaries and responsibility of urban design work when I went to the architect system. Really appreciate that. And um I do realize, you know, realistically more work here and we do have where the project project type, right? When it's uh when it's assigned as that's the architect project. Well, it's assigned as architecture project. It's like the process is like more than. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like, I just like wondering where is the right balance between, because like it's always a good thing to fight um, to that your power you're saying, but there's uh, always a counterbalance mm -hmm. between that. Like, what kind of project do you feel like, okay, this is a work time where this is um, going to be a good example mm -hmm. to, um, you know, Work as a president and versus well, we know this is going to be you no know, work fighting for it. I guess I just want to be done with experience. Where is the balance to judge those kind of situations? Did you hear that, Eva? And no, no, no. So my was, old ears didn't pick that up. No, so was, um, the question I'll just quickly say it because then I think it's actually a perfect, probably, question to end on. Uh, from all four of you to comment, which is. Mm -hmm. How do you choose your battles? Because there are projects where it's a definitive, a landscape architect's leading this project or the architect's leading this project. And so as someone who's interested in making change, how do you sometimes frankly decide what to fight for and what to leave so you can fight another day? It's like, how do you find that balance between when to push and just kind of when to save yourself because the pushing may be better at another opportunity? You want to start? Who? Me? Yes, Eva. I saw your hand was up. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a difficult question because. Um, you asked for difficult questions, Eva. I'm just saying. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that's true that you can't, that it won't be perfect, right? And so. That's also part of it. Uh, Cornelia had this, uh, we called it th the three P's was our, our motto. Um, when we got into kind of trouble, we'd say, oh, time for three P's. And it was persistence, patience, and passion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes it doesn't go or you, you have to use your, your wisdom or best judgment as to when you can push or when you can't. Um, but I, personally, I think, again, it's not an individual uh, battle. It, it's a, just like designing a building or designing a landscape. I, I think the answer lies in teams. So uh, see what your team thinks. Well said, very true. Do you, do you want to jump in, Gina, you know, before we hand it off to the two ladies here to make final comments and wrap us up? Um, sure. Uh, I, I found that uh, the, if, if, you're, if you start off properly to begin with, both in terms of, of a, a, a team, putting a team together and, and deciding to work for a client, if you, if you feel right at the very beginning, that, that you can't work with a client, then don't. Yeah. Uh, and if you, during the process, at any point in time, find that you um, uh, are having difficulty and, and it's going against your principles and your better judgment, then I think you've got to really con consider leaving your client. And over the years, I, I've fired more clients than... Uh, uh, than possibly I should have, but it, it uh, and I was lucky to, to be sort of practicing in a, in an environment where there was lots of work for me to do. Uh, nowadays, I think it's more difficult. Uh, and as Eva says, I think you've really, you really have to do soul searching and decide whether uh, in the long run, 
you're you're going to be successful. It's really the long run. If you're continually doing that, deferring to to your client, then uh, you should try another profession. I love it. <laughs> you got a thumbs up from the team. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to, to my my comment simply follows up with the preceding comments, which is it will be through experience. Every interaction with a client or project is an opportunity to learn. So you figure out the types of projects you don't like by encountering a project that you don't like. Um, and learning how to handle or to engage with clients, mm -hmm. difficult clients or difficult projects comes from learning, perhaps failing in previous projects or emerging successful in a pre previous project. So you know some things that work and some things that don't. Um, I have the least experience of the four of us in terms of length of time in the profession. And so it's a continual learning journey where you're like, okay, next time something like this happens, I won't do this, or I might do that. Or you see someone who is ahead of you that has handled a situation really well. And so you learn from those things. So learning when to push and when to pull back really just comes from experience, I think. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's um, never giving up, you know, regardless of the project, regardless of the client, um, you know, you start by trying, you start by pushing the boundaries, um, you know, and, and educating is a, is a big part of that. Um, and whether or not you can get, you know, to where you want to be or as far as you want to be in terms of making a difference, it's all dependent on the client, but you, you can't not try. Mm -hmm. to try. Yeah. Very true. So um, we're coming to uh, the end. I'm going to ask uh, Amrita come back up uh, just so uh, we can thank her. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Jennifer. And I just as a last comment, want to say that I think the great thing about these conversations, is there's so many kernels to take no matter what profession you're working in, because I think we're all seeing conversations around equity representation, especially in the city around community building. Uh, I, sadly, I do agree with Gino, I think not just North America, because I don't know all in North America, but I know Toronto, and it does feel like we often are mailing things in. Uh, there's, there's so many stories I think we know of missed opportunities around development and design, uh, uh, landscape architecture, urban, just the whole idea around urbanism period. And, his, your all of your comments remind me that we all need to keep fighting um, uh, to make this city a better place to live and to educate the public about good design. Uh, an architect friend once said to me that Toronto had a reputation of quick and cheap because of, of all the glass towers that are <laughs> seem to be going up and being designed. It's true, quick and cheap. Um, and which breaks my heart because then you go to other cities and you see such great design. You're like, why are we not advocating for this? So um, I'm hoping this is being recorded and that us having this conversation and pushing it out in the world helps to do that educating as uh, Gino uh, and, and Eva and uh, Gail and Zara so eloquently mentioned that you have to keep trying. You have to push for collaboration. You have to push, push, push. And sometimes... Um, you don't see the fruit right away, but it will come uh, in the long run. I mean, Cornelia lived to a very ripe old age, so she saw a lot of change. So hopefully we get to see that from all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to say any last words, Emery? I, I just want to thank everyone for this beautiful discussion. It was really amazing. Okay. And I also want to just remind yeah. everyone to go to the uh, Toronto Metropolitan University to see the exhibition. So this is why I want you to come to sit down and say oh. all that again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, and I also want to give a shout out to Carla Parente and Alexander Bresano, who were behind uh, put, installing and putting together the exhibition at the TMU uh, Gallery. It's at 325 Church Street, uh, and you'll have to find your way in there. It's an interesting adventure to get in, but it's really worth the adventure. Uh, we had a picture, but it's not showing. Um, but I also wanted to just thank you for joining in the conversation. This was, again, this is the start of another seed that I think will continue the legacies that you have all created here, too. So um, it was a really beautiful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Gina and Eva. Can we pull them up? Can Tegan, if I give you my phone, can you take a picture? Okay.
Sorry. Thank you all for coming.